what a great feeling. But I believe it demands the question, what's next? It's clarifying where the Lord is leading us, where we will allocate the resources that we gave to our monthly mortgage. So today I'm excited to share the 30,000 foot view of kind of where we're going. And then tonight, we wanna invite you back tonight, whether you're a member or not a member, we encourage you to come. At 5.15, we will have dinner for you. We'll have childcare for you up to the age of 10. And uh, then we'll go into our annual business meeting of Victory Celebration. And I really feel like the Lord is gonna speak some things tonight that all of us need to hear. If you have your Bibles or devices, would you go ahead and turn to the book of Acts? How many know that's a good place to go? And I believe the Lord has a rhema word for us out of Acts 16. You may have read it before in your devotions. You may have glanced at this passage many times, but I really believe the Lord has a word for us today that's gonna stir us, that's gonna motivate us, that's gonna help set the direction for the future of our church. And so would you pray with me? Father, we love you today. Thank you. Lord, that we have the opportunity to celebrate today, Lord, the elimination of our debt. Lord, we know that heaven celebrates every time one sinner repents. And so God, today it's really not just about eliminating our debt, but it's about people. It's about souls. It's about lost people coming to Jesus. It's about placing the seed in the soil of people's hearts. So Father, today I pray that you would galvanize our perspective that it's really about the mission. God, I pray these next few moments, God, whether we are in this room or we're watching online or we're watching later, I pray that you would speak to us that rhema word. I pray that, God, we would be so changed by the word of God today that, God, it wouldn't be something that the enemy could steal. It wouldn't be something that would just last a day or a week, but, Father, I pray that this would lay track for us for the days to come. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for ministering to our children today in nursery and preschool and kids' church. Thank you for the conversations in the cafe, Lord, that are redemptive and life-giving. Father God, we pray that you would lead us today. We thank you. We honor you in Jesus' name. And everybody shout amen. 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 Well, I want to open with some information from the Association of Church Missions Commissions in 1989. They did some studies and they reported that behavioral studies show that if 2% of a homogenous group are strongly dedicated to a given cause, that small minority will eventually move the whole. Now that is mind boggling to me to think just 2% can eventually move the whole group. But it's also very encouraging to me because nearly a year ago, we stood before you and began to cast the vision of how we believe that God has called us to be debt free by the end of 2021 so that we can lunge towards the vision of what God has called us to do in 2022 and beyond. And it wasn't just 2% of you that became dedicated to the cause, but a majority of you said, Pastor, we wanna buy into this. We believe God can do this through us. And six weeks into 2022, we were able to sign off on that mortgage and become debt-free. That now our books are in the black. Praise the Lord, amen? amen? But the exciting news is that your radical generosity and sacrifice has not just impacted our church and our future, but it's inspired other leaders and other churches 
to eliminate their debt so that they can do unrestricted ministry. In fact, I had a conversation with Pastor John Potter at Mitchell Assembly of God. And when he saw that we were trying to eliminate our debt and we're getting close, he called me and we had this conversation and he said, he said, Quentin, he said, we have $17,000 to go on our debt. And he said, that may not seem much like to you, but he said, that's a whole lot for our church. And, uh, and so in that conversation, I said, you know what, we're almost to the end of our debt and I will tell you that we are gonna commit to share the remaining debt that your church has with a match. Amen? Man, he was all excited and I said, if you come up with $8,500 as a church, challenge your church people, we'll do $8,500 and you know what, that'll be less than our mortgage in one month. And so, uh, so we had that conversation, man, he was excited and he stood in front of our, his people just a, a few weeks ago when he said, hey, Sioux Falls First is coming alongside us and, and they're wanting to help us eliminate our debt. And here's the condition I told him, as long as you don't go, go back in debt, right? Don't go back in debt. Let's stay out of debt. Let's not be slave to the lender anymore, right? And, uh, and so um, he, said, he said, deal. And so he stood before his people and he cast that vision. He said, all we have to do is come up with $8,500 and Sioux Falls First will match it and, and we'll be able to eliminate our debt and be debt free. So he got up that Sunday and he said, that Sunday, $1,000 came in for uh, debt elimination, which is a really big deal for that church. The next day, he walked into his office. He went up to his mailbox and there was a white envelope in there. It was sealed, no name on it. And he opened it up and there were 75 $100 bills in that envelope. And so in one day, they were able to eliminate their debt. And so he said, what do I do now? He said, man, we need a church sign. I said, here's what you need to do. We're gonna, we're gonna follow through on our $8,500. But if you need a church sign, he said, yeah, because nobody knows where we are. He said, literally, there's no sign out there. I said, then challenge your people to buy the best sign you can buy. Have the best sign in Mitchell, South Dakota. And put that out in front of your church so everybody knows where you are. So that, so that when people drive by, they know Mitchell Assembly of God has been planted in Mitchell to make a kingdom difference in that community. And so that's what he's going to do. And it was because of your generosity, because of the faithfulness of God through you. I, I received a call from uh, another pastor in Wisconsin and another one in South Dakota that said, hey, um, Quentin, we, we wanna hear how you did it. We, we wanna know what happened to allow you to pay off nearly a million dollars debt in a year with everything going on with the pandemic. And I said, first of all, you need to understand that God's economy is not connected to any economy in this world. It's not a connected to the American economy. We know God is bigger than that, praise God. And we know God owns a cattle on a thousand hills and God uses the faithfulness of his people to meet the need. And that's what happened. And I was able to share with them. And man, they're all excited and they wanna cast vision to their church because they believe God wants to help them get debt free. Had another friend call me the day we announced that we're debt free. And he said, Quentin, he said, we didn't have a lot left. But he said, I want you to know today, he said, we had one person that wrote the check for the remaining debt and now we are debt free. And I said, what about if we started a revolution of debt elimination in South Dakota that actually began to go, go from South Dakota all across this nation and didn't just impact churches, began to impact governments, began to impact other people to realize that, man, you can do so much more when you're not restricted by debt. You can obey what God's called you to do. And so, man, I'm excited that what, what God is doing here is not just impacting here, but it's having kingdom impact beyond this church and beyond this church family. So it's a blessing to see what God is doing. But, but again, it's not just eliminating our indebtedness. It's much bigger than that. In fact, God has a bigger plan. The gospel is always about more people. It's experiencing the life-changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the question on our day that we are celebrating being debt-free is what's next for Sioux Falls First? What's next in the life of our church? Where is God leading us in the future? You see, Lewis Carroll once said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And the problem with that philosophy is 
that it brings chaos and disorder and disparity in the life cycle of any organization. And yet when the vision is clear, when the vision is pronounced, nothing will galvanize a people like the vision that God has laid out in front of us. Nothing will create a movement by us moving the same direction and grabbing a hold of the plan that God has for us. A movement that'll make a difference. In fact, we know that our mission is to lead people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything that we do encircles that principle. And yet the vision is what gives strategy to the mission. And that's why today out of Acts chapter 16, I really feel the Lord has a word for us in the question, what's next? I want you to read with me, beginning at verse one. I'll be reading out of the English Standard Version. It says, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by his brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Tim Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem, which was all about reaching the Jews and the Gentiles. So the churches were strengthened in faith and they increased in numbers daily. How many know that in this post-pandemic world, God wants us to return to a spiritual sense of multiplication? I see other pastors in this, in this uh, room today realizing that God has called us to add to the church daily. That's what God wants to do by his spirit as you and I live out that mission daily, amen? It's not just about Sunday, but it's about every day of the week and I believe God is gonna speak that to us. And it says, and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately, say immediately, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You see, this Macedonian call refers to a God-given vision that directed the route of Paul on his second missionary journey. Paul and his associates were very sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. They were in tune with the Spirit. That the Holy Spirit had already re redirected them twice on this journey. But Paul was now waiting in Troas on the eastern coast of the Aegean Sea. Then Paul received this dream of a man in Macedonia crying out, not just talking to him, but literally like crying out in desperation. Would you come over to Macedonia and help us? I will tell you, friends, that this became such a pivotal moment in the history, the growth and the expansion of the first century church. In fact, this passage of scripture literally changed the trajectory of the church. So today, over these next few moments, I want us to look at two components that apply to us from this vision, this Macedonian call. The first component is the call, the call of God. In fact, the Holy Spirit knew of a people who needed to experience the power of the gospel, which Paul and his companions really knew nothing about. They were lost people in the province of Macedonia who desperately needed Jesus. 
Therefore, the Holy Spirit and his omniscience and, and from his sight of what he could see, he redirected Paul and his companions to Macedonia and they immediately responded to what God was speaking to them. But the vision that came to Paul was a supernatural summons to evangelize the lost. And I believe once again, that is what God is doing today. How does that apply to Sioux Falls First? How does that apply to you and I in this very moment? We know that the foundations of the world are shaking right now. You think of what we've come through through this pandemic. Think of all the craziness that's happened even in the United States of America. Now we see what's happening in Europe and we see what's happening across the globe and we're hearing of wars and rumors of wars and speculations and all of these things that are taking place. We know that the foundations are shaking. People are living in darkness. They're dwelling in hopelessness, looking for answers in all of the wrong places. So many looking for peace and life in the next relationship. We see the sexual or gender confusion. We see people are looking for something to satisfy in substance abuse. We, we see the unprecedented levels of anxiety and depression and people really battling through their emotions really like never before. Friends, we are surrounded by massive need, not only in Sioux Falls, but in this region and even across this nation and around the world. And I wanna to commit to you as your pastor that we are willing to use every tool that God has given us to reach lost people. We know that we have to work while it's day because the night is coming when we will no longer be able to work. That we wanna do all things. We, we, wanna, we wanna be all things to all people that we might win some. We, we will do anything short of sin to reach people who desperately need to know who Jesus is because we know eternity awaits us. And if they're gonna hear, they're gonna hear from you and I. In fact, there's a visionary call in front of us today. The man from Macedonia may be a high level executive who's living in a gated community. Or it may be a homeless person who is sifting through the dumpster for their next meal. The Macedonian woman may be the soccer mom who works out at the gym every day and appears like everything is going well, like she has everything together. Or it may be the sex worker who really gauges her value based on the men who service her. You see, the spiritual need is expressed as a cry for help. Sometimes it's a silent cry of someone suffering in silence. Sometimes it might even be veiled in bitter hostility or even rebellion towards Christ, the church, and the gospel. And yet despite the various ways expressed, we know there is a cry from not only Sioux Falls, but surrounding communities of people who desperately need to experience Jesus. They're saying, come over and help us. We need help. We need somebody to talk to us. We need somebody to give us hope. We need somebody to respond to us. And I wanna tell you that as we've exited our season of debt, we're not going back either. And the Holy Spirit is redirecting us to the spiritual needs that surround us. Now, don't get me wrong. We were radically generous while we were in debt. And we will continually be radically generous in beyond the tithe and missions, helping other churches. But we will also respond to the cries of this region. I believe this is the directive of the Holy Spirit. In fact, we are part of a movement called the Assemblies of God. So grateful for our movement. We know they're not perfect. There's no perfect movement. But we're part of a great missions movement that started that way with clarity to take the gospel to the world. But this past August, we had the opportunity to go to our general council, which happens every two years, and all the pastors and leaders from around the nation gathered together and we gathered in Orlando, Florida. 
And we heard the vision of our leaders, something called MM33. It's a strategy to plant one million churches or campuses around the world by 2033, which is 2,000 years since the death and resurrection of Christ. And you may think that's a tall order. Well, I'm so grateful for leaders that are willing to put out tall orders. Realizing that some things that we know that God links us up with, that some things that God speaks to us, we know could never be accomplished on our own. Could never be accomplished in our own human ingenuity, in our own human strength, with all of the human wisdom we have. We know it will take the Spirit of God to make it happen. But hearing that, men spoke to us and challenged us. We realized that time is short and there needs to be an urgency in people's hearts, every believer's heart, to reach people for Jesus Christ. And so how does that apply to us? In alignment with the assemblies of God and the vision of our leaders, we are casting a local vision. At Sioux Falls First called LC33, Life Change 33, which is to plant campuses as the Spirit of God leads us over the next 11 years, becoming a multi-site church in the days to come. It is really taking the DNA that we love, right? In fact, I've talked to people that have been in this church many, many years. I've talked to people that have just been here a few weeks. And man, they, they love the culture. They love what God is doing here. They love the DNA. They love the opportunity to come and, and receive prayer in the altar. They love the fact that they can come together in community. There's so many things about the culture and the DNA of this church that people love, but it's taking that DNA elsewhere. It's saying we wanna take that DNA into other communities through life change groups and even potentially campuses so what we are experiencing here can, can go and respond to the cries of the Macedonian man or woman or boy and girl and allow them to experience it in their culture, allow them to experience it in their community and experience life change as well. There are people who desperately need Jesus in the community or the neighborhood where you live. And I will tell you that not only is this a corporate call, but this is also a personal call. That God is allowing you to intersect with people in your life so that you can share Jesus with them. So that you can connect them to a local church so they can be discipled, they can grow in their faith. They can be part of a church family. Remember, the church is God's idea. The church is a beautiful thing. And again, I know it's imperfect. I know the bride of Christ makes mistakes and she's imperfect, but I tell you, it's still God's plan. And God has called us to come together as a church and, and disciple and, and, and build people up and allow them to become everything that God has called them to be. And so I wanna challenge you today, church, not to allow this corporate call to blur your personal call. Because over the years, I think we did a disfavor to the body of Christ when we separated pulpit from pew. When we created this great chasm between the clergy and the laity. And we watched people sit back and watch the clergy do their thing. And, 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 and the laity would bring their friends to the clergy and allow them to experience Jesus. And, and man, my heart has been so uh, motivated to speak to you about realizing the call of God on your life. It may not be a vocational call to ministry, but every single person in this room and those watching online today have a call of God in their life. You may be called to the marketplace. You may be called to your job. You, you may be called to your specific neighborhood. You're called to your family, but God has placed a call on your life to minister to people and reach them for Christ. Now I understand it may be discouraging at days where you're planting the seed and you're planting the seed and you're watering the seed and you don't even know that somebody else is watering the seed. And like we read in scripture, uh, Apollos planted, Paul watered, God gives the increase. And you know what? Every day, if we stay faithful to the mission, God is gonna bring people to Jesus through you. God, help us get beyond Sunday. It's not just about Sunday. Man, I'm grateful that you bring lost people to church and they sit in these seats and we can preach the gospel and they get saved and there's nothing more exciting than seeing people saved on Sunday other than when people are being reached for Jesus through the week. And you come and tell us, you know what, I led my friend, I led my coworker, I led my fellow classmate, I led my family member to Jesus. Man, that's what God wants to do. That's what the church is supposed to be doing. You're the priesthood. God's place is anointing on you. 
God's put that on you to reach people for Jesus. Man, I think of Pastor Tom and the direct line, what's happening at the hospitals and how you're preaching Jesus and many are coming to Christ. In the jails and the prisons, in the nursing homes, in our neighborhoods, God has called us. There's a call that is alive and well. You'll hear more about the call tonight. This leads to the second component, which is the consequences. Now, when we hear this word, we usually take it as a negative connotation. But I wanna say our actions, whether they're good or bad, have consequences. And you see Paul's obedience led to consequences. You see, up to this point in history, the gospel had been limited to Asia. But from this moment on, when Paul and his companions responded in obedience to the Macedonian vision, the call, Christianity spread like fire through Europe and even into the Western world. I wonder where we would be today if Paul wouldn't have obeyed. Where would we be as a nation? Where would our knowledge of Christ be if Paul wouldn't have obeyed? But here's some other things that took place. We see Lydia's conversion. We see a demon-possessed slave girl who is fortune-telling become delivered. We see the conversion of a jailer and his family when Paul and Silas were in prison. Paul's teaching in Athens to all these philosophers that were worshiping an unknown God. He gave them the truth and ignorance was removed and many of them came to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. There were churches planted in Macedonian cities. Think about this. The churches of Philippi, Thessalonica, and Corinth. These churches were extremely influential in the spread of the gospel around the world. Five of the New Testament epistles were written to three of these churches. The history of the world and church was changed because of the obedience of Paul and his companions. Imagine would have been missed. We don't know where we would be if Paul would have been disobedient. People would have died while still in darkness. Let's be real. There's people in heaven today that wouldn't be there. Many communities would have never been transformed. The detachment from hope because there was no one to give people the good news. You see, the price of, a, of disobedience is enormous. And I'm so grateful today as a church, as a church family, we are choosing to obey the vision that God is putting before us. So what are the consequences of that obedience? I see in Isaiah 58, 12, that we will rebuild the ancient ruins. Come on. We will raise up the foundation of many generations of Christ followers. We will repair the breach. We will restore the streets to dwell in. Think of the impact that we will not only have on individuals, on their family tree, but what we'll have on our state, our nation, and even people around the world. The impact of our obedience, because obedience has consequences. You see, God will continue to write history through us and accomplish things we never thought possible if we will just be obedient to what he's calling us to do. And so I wanna to close today with a piece of history detailing the obedience of a previous generation. That's Sioux Falls first, our forefathers. It was in the early 70s. There's a group of people meeting downtown Sioux Falls at 112 East 13th Street that felt God was leading them to do what's next in the life of their church at that time called Gospel Tabernacle. Dr. Jim Allen and the deacon team felt led of the spirit to purchase property on the west side of I-29. The problem is the west side of Sioux Falls was sparsely 
populated at best. In fact, I talked to somebody today that has a father that knows a lot about history here in the city. And he said that the asphalt road, he don't believe even extended beyond 29 at the time. So it was a dirt road out here that they would have to grate. There wasn't anything out here. In fact, from our research, there was only a few farmhouses on this side of 29. And so because of that decision, they were highly criticized by people in the community for purchasing 26 acres of worthless real estate and constructing a building in 1978 when they dedicated that property out here in the middle of nowhere they became First Assembly of God. Little did everyone know that God saw what people didn't see, that now Sioux Falls First at 6300 West 41st Street is strategically located to the largest high school in the state of South Dakota. That we've been planted in one of the greatest population centers in our entire state. And I will tell you that it continues to grow west and it continues to grow east and it continues to grow south and north. And instead of complaining about all this growth and the traffic, I know I can do that. Let's begin to thank the Lord that even though this church was established in missions and we send missions teams and we go around the world, that God is sending people here into our lives so that we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them and they can experience his life-changing power in their lives. So God, help us to be tuned in to your spirit. Be watching and realize, Lord God, that our obedience has consequences. In fact, thousands of lives have been impacted by this one faith-filled decision that everyone thought was crazy at the time. Let's be honest. We are experiencing the consequences of someone's obedience today. And our prayer is, that other people will experience the consequences of our obedience tomorrow. Amen. Church, would you bow your heads with me? Father, we love you today. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate even in the midst of everything happening in the world. And again, we do pray for our Ukrainian brothers and sisters during this difficult time. God, we are so broken. We are so moved by that. Lord God, I thank you that there are even people that are obeying your call and taking them resources and helping them in this time of crisis. And we speak your blessing over those who are going, those who are sending, those who are responding. And Father God, I thank you today that we are here in this paid off beautiful facility on some of the best acreage in this entire city because someone was obedient that we are experiencing the consequences of the obedience of our forefathers. In the same way today, Lord, as you're speaking to us, allow other people, other generations, because we know that God, you're not a one generational God. You're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're the God that desires to do things that last beyond generations. I pray, Lord, as we obey you, as we follow you, as we say, here I am, Lord, send me. Lord, I pray that the next generations would experience the consequences of our obedience. And Lord, if there's anyone in this room, anyone watching online today that does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, Father, that maybe they walked into this building or maybe they sat in their living room today, and it may be silent, but God, there's a cry. There's a cry that rises from their heart. God, they may not even know 
what it looks like. They may not even be able to articulate it. But Father, I pray today they would encounter your love. They would encounter your redemption. They would know that Jesus was sent here, his God in the flesh, to die on a cross for us, to take our place, that we could experience eternal life, that we could experience transformation in our heart. That God, the things that we thought satisfied that never do, sin, that we'd be able to turn away from that and turn towards you in a, in a demonstration of repentance. And that you would change us from the inside out. That old things are passed away and everything becomes brand new in Christ. That it's not just about debt elimination, but it's about sin elimination. God, you said that when we confess our sin and we repent, that you don't even remember that sin anymore. If there's anybody here today with heads bowed and eyes closed, you would say, Pastor Quentin, that's me. I need Jesus. Today, I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. My life is not headed the right direction. Is there anybody that's here that would wave, wave their hand and say, that's me? Just wave at me. If you're online, please notify our, our online pastor. I see that hand. Anybody else? Anybody else say, that's me? On the floor, in the balcony. Anybody here today? Well, church, would you stand? Father, we love you today. And God, we thank you for those that are watching online today, those that are in this room that may have raised their hands or made their cry verbal. I pray that you would meet them where they are. I pray they would encounter the life-changing power of the gospel right now. Lord, it's not just about making bad people good, but it's about making dead people alive. And we know that's what you do. And God, I believe today, Lord, as we have some that have said, yes, Lord, that we know that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Lord, I pray you administer to them. I pray that they would realize that they have been welcomed into the family. They're children of God. You've adopted them. And God, I pray that you'd help them understand that as they begin their spiritual journey with this decision, that it becomes a lifelong and even eternity long journey of growth, becoming more like you. Lord, we love you today. We're, we celebrate what you've done. We celebrate lives changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Here's what we're gonna do as we close. I wanna encourage you to come back at 515. Can you say 515? You get to eat at 515, all right? 515. But I wanna close out just celebrating. Obviously, for those that responded to Christ, for those yet to respond to Christ because of our obedience. Somebody gonna call out some pre-Christians in this community and in our state and our nation that need Jesus, amen. 